our next speaker is Arno Loret, or uh, the API handyman. He's from Paris, and uh, he is a senior API architect at uh, Natixis. And he is the author of the design of uh, everyday APIs. So in this session, I would like to show how the design of everyday objects can help us to design APIs and to help us about their purpose, their usability, and how their design can be constrained. So the very first mission of API designers is to ensure that the purpose of the API they are designing is actually the good one. So let me introduce the Kitchen Radar 3000. Bringing top of the art military grade radar components into your kitchen, the Kitchen Radar 3000 will help you to become the fastest cook in the universe. If you do not believe me, let's see how we can cook a chocolate cake in a few minutes using the Kitchen Radar 3000. Put 200 grams of dark chocolate, 80 grams of butter, 3 tablespoons of milk in a glass container. Put the glass container in the kitchen radar, push and hold the magnetron on button for one minute. Take the glass container out, add 3 eggs, 80 grams of sugar, 50 grams of flour. Mix well, put it again in the kitchen radar, push and hold the magnetron button for another 6 minutes. And you're done. You baked a delicious chocolate cake in less than eight minutes. The Kitchen Radar 3000 is made to heat food at light speed, but it can also defrost food. But to defrost food, you need less heating power. And as the magnetron uh, heating power cannot be modulated, it has to be turned on and off at regular pace to generate less heating power. Hopefully, the Kitchen Radar 3000 comes with a very handy documentation to help you. So, according to this documentation, to defrost food, we need to hold the magnetron hunt button for 13 seconds, then release it for 13 seconds, and so on, as long as necessary. It's like playing video games. That's really fun. Well, not at all. The Kitchen Radar 3000 is a terribly designed device. It simply exposes its inner workings through its interface. Therefore, its purpose does not make any sense for users. Users don't, do not want to turn a magnetron on, they want to eat food. Another consequence is that its interface is awfully complicated to use. Users have to hold a button or push it for in some rhythm. They also have to time themselves, and the documentation did not succeed to fix all this mess. It's exactly the same when you design API. Although an API is an application programming interface allowing software to communicate with each other, it's first and foremost an interface for developers, people. An API must have a purpose that makes sense for these people. It must fulfill these people's needs without bothering them with internal concerns. If not, you are designing a kitchen radar API that will be a nightmare to understand and a nightmare to use. See, users need only users need 20 lines of code to use the Kitchen Radar API, and they need only one to use the Microwave Oven API. And don't even dare to think that documentation will fix your bad design. You would be greatly disappointed. So, finding the right purpose is the first step, but. Having a right purpose does not mean that your API will be magically usable. Have you ever feel outrageously smart when using something for the first time? You know when everything is so easy and intuitive that you can find all of an object's possibility by yourself. This is possible not only because you are actually outrageously smart, but also because the object you are using has been designed in order to make it totally straightforward and predictable. 
There are three things to think about to achieve a straightforward design that people will understand instantly. Representations, interactions, and flows. What could be this device? With its cryptic labels and numbers, it's impossible to guess its purpose, not how to operate it, by just looking at it. What if we change a few things, like this? What a surprise, it's an alarm clock. These two devices have exactly the same purpose, but propose two different representations of it. Which one do you prefer? The straightforward alarm clock or the quite cryptic womb? What is terrible for an everyday object's usability is as terrible for API's usability. When we design an API, we must take care of the representations we choose. An alarm clock is obviously an alarm clock, while a womb is, well, we don't know. Uh, when using uh, an API, users must understand any name at first sight. Who knows how to decipher a Unix timestamp? The number of seconds since the 1st January of 1970. Nobody, besides programs. But remember, there are not only programs who use APIs. People use them. So API users must be able to understand data formats without effort, so choose them wisely. When using an alarm clock, who cares about the number of seconds until the alarm rings? Nobody. People want to know at which time it will ring. So when you design an API, carefully choose the data that will really be relevant for users. Choosing straightforward representation is a good start, but it's only the first step. We do not just stare at objects or APIs, we also interact with them. Is there something more terrifying than a washing machine's control panel? I don't think so. Some very basic ones are almost impossible to use for mere mortals. You have to choose a program with cryptic names or cryptic icons, a temperature between cool and very hot, spin speed, adjust water level, and after laboriously choose all these parameters, the machine may not start. And of course, it will not tell you why. It will be up to you to find out. It may be simply because you forgot to close the door. Then you close the door and the machine starts, but it does not tell you when it will end its washing cycle. I just wanted to wash my jeans. Why does it have to be so complicated? Fortunately, there are other washing machines which are far more user-friendly. They provide far more straightforward interactions. A big knob lets you select the type of laundry, like jeans, and you're done. The machine choose clean rinse cycle, water level, water temperature, spin speed, according to the laundry type you selected and the laundry weight given by your weight center. You may adjust these parameters if you want, but the configuration made by the machine is accurate in most of the case. If you forgot to close the door, a big LCD screen tells you that you forgot to close the door. And when the machine starts, it tells you uh, that your clothes will be clean in 45 minutes. Do not let your APIs be like those creepy basic washing machines. Design straightforward API interactions. Only request minimal and straightforward inputs. Avoid requesting thousands of complicated parameters that could be determined on the server side. Avoid just telling, oh, there's a problem, but we won't tell you why. Provide informative error feedbacks that actually help to solve the problems. And also, avoid, uh, also provide informative feedback in case of success and avoid some basic like, oh, okay, it's done. When we use an object or an API, it's common to chain interactions to achieve our goal. And obviously, any interaction flow must be as straightforward as possible. Let's say you are on the fifth floor of a building ready to explode and filled with aggressive aliens. To escape, you need to take one of the elevators to the 16th floor where a shuttle is waiting for you. 
If the elevator system is basic one, there is a single call button. Once you push it, you have to wait, not knowing which elevator cabin will come. A bell ring when one of them arrived. You walk in, push uh, the 16th floor button. And unfortunately, this elevator was going down, so you go to the ground floor, hoping that an alien will not come into the cabin. Fortunately, it does not happen. And after that, you finally go up to the 16th floor where you can take the... Ah, too late. The building has exploded. Hopefully, this elevator system can be improved. To prevent the ground floor error, we can add some LCD screen outside each elevator cabin to show if it goes up or down. It's better, but why stopping an elevator which goes down for people who want to go up? We can replace the single call button by two up and down ones. Therefore, you can call an elevator to go up or down, and only cabins going in that direction will stop on your floor. It's even better. But you still have to push a second button to tell on which floor you want to go. In some systems, the up and down buttons have been replaced by a touchscreen. You um, select your uh, floor on this touchscreen, and then the touchscreen tells you, oh, you have to go to cabin A, B, C, or D. And you're done. And you can escape uh, the uh, evil, evil aliens. Sorry. So API interaction flows can be improved using exactly the same principles. Improving feedback and inputs to prevent errors, minimizing the number of steps by aggregating actions. Designing straightforward APIs seems relatively straightforward once you know how to do it, but is there some way to be even more straightforward? Yes, we can create APIs which are so straightforward that users can guess and predict how they work. And a good way to provide a predictable design is to provide a consistent design. The place symbol, we, this triangle, we were used to see on media players is now used on more and more devices, such as washing machines. But whatever the device, this button has the same purpose. Start what the device is supposed to do. Wherever you see this symbol, you know what it means. Objects sharing common design features have a consistent design, which makes them easier to use because you already know how to use them. To achieve a consistent design, an API must be consistent with itself. If you decided that a customer ID was a customer ID, don't dare to call it account ID elsewhere in your API. It might confuse users. An API should also be consistent with other API inside an organization. Sharing common features like security or error handling will reduce the learning curve. Once users have learned to use an API inside your organization, they will be able to use the next one really quickly without any effort. And an API, an API sorry, should also be consistent with the rest of the world. There are standards and common practices that can, you can use in your design. You need a country code, use ISO 3166 standard. You design a REST API, don't dare to use the 200 OK HTTP status code to say, oh, there is a problem. If you follow common practices and standard, Totally new users will feel like home and when they discover your API for the first time and will be able to use it without any effort. Another way of creating a predictable design is to cheat and be able to adapt to users. Two persons of different height can use the same car because each of them can tune the seat and steering ring according to their liking. Providing adaptable API design can be done by providing simple features such as pagination, filtering, sorting. You can also let people choose between GSV, CSV, uh, PDF, and even MP3 audio uh, file representation of your data with content negotiation. If you provide an API worldwide, you should think about internationalization and localization to provide data with accurate uh, formats and units and language. You may even let people choose exactly the data they want by providing a GraphQL API, for example. But 
be warned that being too much adaptable may make your API complex to use. Users may be lost if you provide too much possibilities. A last way to provide a predictable design is to provide a discoverable design. When you read a book, and especially technical or practical one, you are usually glad to find a table of content, listing available chapters and sections and on which page they start. With such table of content, you have an overriding idea of the book content, and you can jump directly to a given section thanks to the page number printed on each page. You can read the book without, without all this information, but it's less easy to do. And APIs can be discoverable just like books. You can provide metadata for pagination, for example. If you design a REST API, you can create an hypermedia API providing links as metadata to help consumers browse the API. You can take advantage of the underlying protocol. Uh, with the HTTP protocol, you can use the options method, which tell you which method you can use on a resource. But this is well and good. We have to focus on usability. But it must not be done without forgetting that the design we are building can be constrained. How people use objects and APIs may affect their design. You do not design a watch the same way if it's a regular watch or a diving one. Both are made to give time, but a true diving watch has to deal with some constraints that do not apply to regular watches. A diving watch must support, support to be immersed uh, in water at 100 meters. Its users must be able to read time in total darkness. And these constraints impact its design. API design can be affected in such ways too. When used in a mobile environment, where latency is a key concern, an API shouldn't be too fine-grained. If a mobile application has to chain three API calls sequentially to do something, it will have to suffer three times the latency to establish a network connection to the API server. On the 3G networks, it means waiting something like 600 milliseconds. That's an eternity for the human brain. People may get bored while waiting. Such mobile application problems may be solved by creating coarser grain APIs, but it may also be interesting to build a dedicated backend for front end, providing a mobile optimized version of the API. If your API provides information that consumers need to get regularly, they may be tempted to pull on your API to do many calls, and many of them will be unnecessary. If you provide a webhook, you can provide them updates when needed. You can also imagine to provide streaming APIs using WebSockets or server sent events. It may also uh, sometimes make sense to provide batch or bulk endpoints, allowing your users to make a huge amount of requests in one shot. So, as API designers, we must take care of how the API will be used to be sure to provide a relevant design that will really fit user needs. But the constraints may not be only on the consumer side. In the first part of this session, I told you kind of that you should focus on the user's point of view and forget what's really happening behind the API. Well, it's not entirely true. The QWERTY keyboard layout was invented at the end of the 19th century due to mechanical constraints on typewriters. On a typewriter, characters are mounted on metal arms, and these arms can clash and jam if two neighboring ones are pressed at the same time. To avoid this problem, commonly uh, used letter pairs like TH or ST in English were placed so their arms were not neighboring anymore. The QWERTY design was less user-friendly at that time than uh, an ABCD one, but people could type faster. It was a reasonable design compromise. As API designers, we may have to compose with constraints imposed by the underlying implementation and do such design compromises. 
On very old legacy systems, some scalability issues may force you to limit the number of calls per second to, on your API. Some performance issues may have more impact on the API design and lead to the creation of asynchronous APIs. For example, processing a huge video file to detect kittens may take some time. Therefore, consumers may send the video with a first request and come back later to get the result of the processing. Or the system may call them back using a webhook to tell them that the processing has ended. Some constraints may even turn into a no-go for an API. Like, if your system is not running on 24-7, it may not be a good idea to provide a public-facing open API. Of course, with enough time and money, such implementation constraints may be solved, and API designers could focus on usability. So, as API designers, if you find something like this, always check if by chance this constraint can be solved. But we do not live in an ideal world. We do not always have sufficient time and money. So be also ready to compose with such constraints. And this is the end. We have covered many topics in less than 20 minutes. What are the main things you should keep in mind to avoid uh, to design kitchen radar APIs? Two words, empathy and context. API design is about empathy and context. Think about your users, think about how they will use your API, think about how your API is built, and most important, be inspired by the design of everyday objects. It will really be of great help to design great APIs. Thank you very much.